Okay, everyone, welcome back. We're ready to move on to the next talk. So the next talk is from Olivier Catoni. Olivier Catoni is a senior researcher at uh, CNRS, uh, so the French uh, Research Institute, and is now part of the Université Paris-Saclay. So Olivier has authored many, many works on equation theory in a lot of monographs too, which were massively cited in the morning. So he will tell us about dimension-free equation bounds. Thank you very much. I would like to thank the organizers for this very nice workshop on Pack Bayesian uh, learning. And uh, the work I will present is uh, brand new and it, it's co authored by Ilaria Giulini, one of my former PhD students. And uh, I'm going to talk. It's, I have to be closer, yes. <coughs> so I, I'm going to talk about three related subjects using packed Bayesian bounds. The first one is a very simple but uh, basic subject in statistics. It consists in estimating, sorry, in estimating the mean of a random vector. So I will uh, assume that X is a random vector in RD, but the result could be generalized to separable Hilbert spaces. And uh, the, the goal will be to prove bounds that will not depend on the dimension d of the ambient space. And a related problem is to estimate the mean of a random matrix from an IID sample made of n independent copies. And we will use these estimates to solve uh, linear least squares regression problems. So the dimension-free assumptions I'm going to make are assumptions concerning uh, the second moment in the two first cases and the fourth moment in the case of the regression setting. And uh, so the, the, the obtaining uh, uh, estimators for the, the mean with sub-Gaussian behavior uh, under weak uh, variance assumptions it has been a hot topic in the, in the last uh, years and there are uh, interesting and uh, fundamental papers by Lugazi, uh, Minsker, and uh, Mendelssohn, for instance, about this, starting with the one-dimensional case. So uh, the approach here will be to not, not to tackle directly the estimation of the mean in, in uh, dimension higher than one, but in estimating directional means by considering uh, the unit ball of RD. And uh, in a similar way, for matrices, we will estimate this one-dimensional uh, uh, mean for each possible choices of a psi and theta. And this will allow to control the operator norm of uh, the uh, uh, of the, the, the difference between the estimated mean matrix and, 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 and and the mean matrix. And, and the idea to deduce results about this square is to remark that the least square risk can be written up to a constant, the expectation of y to the square that does not depend on feature, in terms of the expectation of the Gram matrix and of the expectation of a vector that is y times x. So if we have dimension independent estimates for the Gram matrix and for the the mean of y x, we can deduce results for uh, solving uh, uh, these squares in a, in a, in a high-dimensional space and also in, in a Hilbert space, so, uh, uh, infinite-dimensional Hilbert space. So, the, the, so what we have to do here is to have results that are uniform with respect to the direction theta. And to obtain this uniformity with respect to that direction feature, we will use uh, a packed Bayesian bound. So the general form of the bound I'm going to use is this one. It, so uh, for any uh, parameter delta, that will be the, the confidence level of the deviation bounds, we'll be able to prove a result about a, a perturbed version of the uh, uh, empirical mean. So uh, we are going to uh, 
control uniformly an empirical process, but using a perturbation of the, of the parameter uh, feeder. And so we, we find this uh, log uh, Laplace uh, expectation here that uh, was already introduced in, in the previous talks. And uh, so what is important, of course, the, the, the quantifiers are very important. The, the, the whole idea is to be able to, to prove a result with probability one minus data that are valid for all possible choices of uh, posterior measure rho. And as was already explained in previous talks, the uh, complexity factor here is measured by the cutback uh, divergence between rho and a measure mu on the parameter space, a probability measure, that has to be uh, non-random, non non independent from the sample. So mu is fixed and rho is, can be anything and so it can depend in, on, on the values of the sample. So here we are going to specialize to Gaussian computations uh, in a way that is very similar to the way margin bounds were proved by uh, John Schoteller and Langford for SVM, for support vector machines. So we are going to use the, this, this pack Bayesian inequality that is valid for any choice of rho and mu. We are going to use it for uh, Gaussian perturbations of the parameter. And this will uh, make it possible to have uh, explicit computations. So rho feeder will be the, the Gaussian uh, measure uh, with, with mean feeder and <coughs> covariance matrix one over beta times the identity. So here we are using uh, uh, perturbations with a covariance matrix equal to one. And mu will simply be, so, so, so here we, we the, of course, we want to raise, we are looking for a result that is going to be uniform for uh, any feature on the unit sphere. So as the posterior will be any, anywhere on the unit sphere, as a prior, we will choose the, <coughs> the Gaussian measure centered at zero with, with the same co covariance structure. And if we choose the identity as, a, as the covariance structure, it's because this will allow us to have a, a cutback divergence term that will be the, the norm related to the norm of the parameter. And in, in, in this setting, this is what we are looking for. In a previous paper, I had explored the possibility to have here a, a covariance structure that is the, the related to the gram, gram matrix, and this would lead to results that depend explicitly on the dimension D. So we, here I, I want results that are independent of the dimension, and so I will choose a, a, an entropy factor here, a, a complexity factor that is measured by the norm, the Euclidean norm of, of feature. So the complexity will be measured by a parameter that will be independent of a dimension. So now we've got to choose the function f. Yeah. Sorry? The mu yeah. in the inequality appears in a k divergence. Yeah. But as does it appear, only there? So does the mu appear anywhere as in the k divergence in this inequality? No, it, it appears, it, it's, it's the only place, place where mu appears here. Okay. And uh, so it, it, it's a, a sort of a weight, mu would be. So a, a sort of prior weight you place on the, on the parameter space. And it will use, be used to somehow measure the, the dimension of the parameter space. And uh, the proof is quite simple. You have to, to compute the expectation of the exponential of the, dif the difference between the two sides of the inequality. And then uh, using uh, Jensen inequality or using uh, uh, the the the, the, inequal, the dense curve had an inequality. You you you, you can uh, uh, transform this in, uh, into the expectation of 
you can integrate outside from the exponential, both with respect to the sample distribution and with respect to mu, and you integrate something that is equal to one because you have compensated for the, for the expectation here. And then you use Markov inequality to, to prove the, the result here. And, and does, it, does it answer your question? And, and there's no assumption on, on F. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, uh, in fact, yeah, it, it's more straightforward to prove the f this when f is bounded. But the, the the idea is that whenever this this inequality has a meaning, because things are integrable, you, you can if even define a, 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 in a weak sense. I think that if you define when f is not integrable, if you define this to be minus infinity as soon as the uh, negative part of f. As, a, as an integration uh, integrates to minus infinity, you can it, it, it can be generalized <coughs> as long as it has a meaning. It can be generalized. And, and the expectation, the, the, the first term on the right hand side, the expectation is over uh, the theta prime and uh, both theta prime and x. No. no, 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 no. Here it's the expectation with respect to x. Which is mu. Oh, so it's so it's x. Okay. Sorry. So what is the distribution of x? We, we are uh, working in, in the first case here. We've, we've, uh, w w the sample is, is, uh, is made of n independent copies of a random vector x. And uh, the expectation is with respect to the distribution of x. Is it OK? Sorry. So here it's the expectation with respect to x. And here is, 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 is the empirical mean. Is that okay? Yeah, it's just that it's not in the form that we are used. It's okay. In, a, in, in, some, in some sense, uh, the, the pack Bayesian uh, bounds can be uh, viewed as a way to control the supremum of uh, an empirical process except that we don't control the supremum with respect to feature, but with respect to arbitrary perturbations of feature. But somehow, if you have to control the deviations of something that can be written as the supremum or the infimum of an empirical process, you can use this kind of uh, fact Bayesian bounds. Mm -hmm. And so you can use this, pattern, uh, this bounds as a replacement for concentration of measures of measure inequalities when you don't want to control a, a general Lipschitz function of uh, x1, xn, but a function that can be written as a supremum of an empirical process, something that happens quite often in statistics. So we are going to specialize this by making uh, a, a series of choices. I, I already told about the choice of the perturbation that will be Gaussian to be able to do uh, explicit uh, computations. And uh, so now we have to, to choose f. So the, the, the most obvious choice of f would be to choose f uh, of the form lambda times theta primes, uh, the dot product between theta primes and xi. But if we do that, we will be able to control what we are interested in, that is the dot product of theta and of the expectation of x but under assumptions where we will have exponential moments of this form, because here we have the expectation of the exponential of f. So if f is just the identity, uh, it's just uh, the dot product here times a, a, a scale constant, uh, then we will have to make uh, exponential moment assumptions that we would rather not make. So a trick to to, to be able to work under uh, weaker hypotheses is to use uh, an influence function to obtain uh, robust results. An influence function is psi. So f of theta prime and xi is going to be psi times uh, lambda times the dot product between theta prime and xi. And we will choose psi to be uh, close to the identity. But uh, psi would be chosen to be some sort of uh, mean of converting exponentials to polynomials. 
So the, expo the exponential of psi of t should be bounded by polynomials. <coughs> and the polynomials, of course, will be uh, related to the Taylor expansion of order 2 of the exponential. And psi will be uh, symmetric, bounded, and we want also in the, ch in, in the list of uh, things we would like to have for the inference function psi, we would like also to be able to do explicit computations of psi of lambda times theta primes dot xi when rho is uh, Gaussian. So it's possible to, to find such an influence function. Uh, we can squeeze in a, a polynomial between the, the, the two functions minus log of 1 minus t, uh, the, the two functions, in, there is a polynomial in between. Uh, in the interval minus square root of two, square root of two, but we, we are going to, uh, and outside from this interval, we are going to define psi to be constant. And if we do so, we have, a, since psi is, poly, is a piecewise polynomial, then we can compute uh, the expectations here because when theta prime is a, a multidimensional Gaussian, theta prime times xi will be a, a, a one-dimensional Gaussian, and it's possible to make explicit computations of piecewise polynomials, polynomial functions of a, of, of a one-dimensional Gaussian random variables by integrating by part. So more precisely, if I define uh, if I define phi of m and sigma to be the expectation of psi applied to a one-dimensional Gaussian variable with mean m and standard deviation sigma, uh, phi of m and, and sigma has an explicit, uh, we can write it in an explicit form that can be computed. And that depends on the distribution function of the, ga of the normal uh, distribution. With a reminder here that is not very nice to look at, but that is simple to, to write in a computer program. And essentially, the remainder here is small because this f of a minus uh, square root of 2 plus something will behave like an exponential. So it's basically it's equal to m times 1 minus sigma square over 2 minus m to the 3 over 6 plus a reminder term that is explicit. So we can, with, with the help of the expression for phi, we can explicitly compute the perturbations outside from the influence function. And uh, this way, we will turn polynomials, uh, we will turn exponential moments into polynomials. The, uh, so now I'm talking about this, this part of the back Bayesian inequality that takes this, this special form here, and this is bounded by the properties of the influence function, by the log of one plus uh, fir the first and second moment here. So using now the fact that log of one plus r is uh, less than r, this is bounded by this quantity, where we have here the second moment in direction theta, that is somehow the variance term. Well, the, the inequalities here, are, are, are the, 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 the study I'm doing here is not centered. So I, I will explain later how to center the, the, the analysis, but uh, so it's, it's somehow the uncentered uh, directional variance here. And here you have the total variance that is divided by the parameter beta that controls the size of the perturbation of the parameter that has been uh, used. So at this stage, we can see that we will be able to complete what we, our goal. We'll be able to estimate the directional derivatives uniformly in theta, the directional expectations uniformly in theta. And the, the, the bound will not involve the, the dimension d of the ambient space. And also, uh, it will involve only these two moments so uh, we will be able to have a, a result under weak variance assumptions. So if we put all, all, put all these things together, 
we obtain the following uh, pack Bayesian inequality. So for uh, that is going to define in a, in a, in a f first uh, a confidence region. So with probability one minus delta for any feature in the unit sphere, this uh, estimator of the expectation in direction feature will be less than the expectation in direction feature plus uh, here a, a variance term here and here you get a uh, complexity term uh, here also if you want or uh, and these two terms are related to the perturbation so, so to the, the, the measure of the, the dimension of the parameter space so then if you assume that we know but what we have known finite bounds for these two moments of order two, then we can optimize the choice of lambda and of beta in this way. And we will obtain, by, by working both for theta and minus theta to have the reverse inequality. We are on the units first. We, we, we need to prove inequalities only in one, on one side because the inequality on the other side is obtained by looking at minus theta. So here we have a, a confidence region defined by uh, the estimator, the direc directional estimator E of theta. And so this is a convex, uh, convex set. And for comparison, uh, the concentration inequalities available for a Gaussian vector are uh, of this form. And so you, you can prove it in different ways. This is the concentration inequality that is uh, cited by Lugosi and Mandelson. And an interesting thing is that you can, if you don't know how to prove it, you can prove it just by using what I've already explained, but uh, uh, remo by removing the inference function and doing explicit computations with the uh, Gaussian, if you assume that X is Gaussian. So the interesting thing is to see what we have lost by comparison with the Gaussian uh, case. So uh, we have lost the centering in the definition of T and V, because in the Gaussian case we have a cent centered, the centered second moment, directional and, and, non and global here. Uh, we have lost adaptivity in T and V, because we have assumed that T and V were known bounds. And uh, we have a confidence region that is no more bold. Here, the confidence region is a ball center that's the uh, empirical mean. But here, as we have applied the inference function to the, scale, to the dot product of theta and x, i, we have a confidence region that is convex, but that is not necessarily a ball. A ball. But what is encouraging in, in the, in the other, on the other hand is that the, the, the numerical constants are exactly the same as in the Gaussian case. So under the mild assumptions that you have second moments, you can find an estimator, but uh, at least a confidence region, that we have the, the same diameter as in, in the Gaussian case, but that will not be a ball anymore. So now if you want uh, an estimator, you can just pick uh, a point it, within the... In, within the the confidence region. The confidence region contains the, the true expectation, so it can't be uh, it can't be uh, void. So there is at least one with priority one minus delta <laughs> on the event on which the pack Bayesian bound is, 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 is satisfied. There is uh, you, you can find uh, m feature within the confidence region, and 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 when you look. At uh, the so as you have, then you deduce from this that theta times the difference between m hat and the expectation of x is bounded by two times this this quantity. Okay, so I have to speed up things quite a bit, <laughs> uh, but it's I think it was useful to explain the beginning um, in detail. So now you have this kind of bound for, for the, uh, the Euclidean norm of the uh, estimation error. 
and, and here you, you lose a, a factor two, but in fact you, 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 can, you, you, you use a, a factor two if you are very unlucky. You could reduce this two to square root of three by setting m hat to be the middle of the diameter of the confidence region, if you want. And if you are, and if you are uh, lucky and the confidence region is not far from a ball, you, you, you should be able to have a rather constant close to one here. Okay. So now the, 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 the result is not centered, but you can center it by, apply, by, by a, a random, uh, by a, a sample splitting argument, quite standard. You, you, you take a, sm a small amount of the sample to have a pre-estimator, a coarse estimator of the mean, and then you, 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 you work with the, the, the remaining part of your sample. And if you do that, you will have an estimator for the mean uh, with uh, uh, an estimation error that will be uh, equivalent to uh, uh, what you obtain with centered, centered definitions of the, of the moments here. Okay, so I will go fast on, 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 the, on the rest. So you can do the same, the same kind of things with matrices by controlling uh, this kind of quantity with uh, so, uh, so instead of, in, in the vector case, you control uh, the dot product of uh, theta prime and mi, and here you have, you have two parameters, xi. So we are looking at matrices of size p times q, and by controlling this quantity, we can, uh, we can prove similar results for matrices. And uh, the difference with vectors is that we will be able to uh, study the uh, operator norm of the statistical error. And so, uh, so we can compute almost explicitly the, uh, the, the estimator, the directional estimator. And we have a packed Bayesian inequality in which you have various terms that appears, it, uh, and the, 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 the largest one is the Hilbert-Schmidt norm of the matrix. And uh, uh, now you have to optimize the parameters, so, uh, assuming that you, you, if you know bounds for the Hilbert-Schmidt norm of M and for the operator norm of M times M transpose and M transpose times M, and of course for the variance term, and if you choose the parameters uh, in an optimized way, you will obtain here for the operator norm, but this is going to give a, a result for the operator norm, that is uh, defined and in terms of these quantities. And what you gain with respect to a vector, so if you apply the result for a vector to a matrix, you, you, you obtain a result in, in, in Hilbert-Schmidt norm, because the, the scalar product for matrix is, uh, gives the Hilbert-Schmidt norm. But here we have an improvement and it's the fact that instead of having a complexity term of, of, of size t over v, we, have, we gain a square root here. So the, the, the directional estimate will be of, of order uh, the square root of v times t over n, something that uh, is, uh, is lower than what you obtain for the Hilbert-Schmidt Hilbert norm. Okay. So I will be very. F I will go very fast on the, on the rest of my presentation. Mm -hmm. So one question you can ask is whether it's possible to adapt to the parameters I assume to be known in the in the beginning, and the answer is, is yes to, to a certain point by using a asymmetric influence functions. So instead of squeezing the influence function between uh, minus log of one minus t plus t square over two and log of one, I squeeze it between uh, uh, two terms so, so, so that the exponential of psi is going to be squeezed between uh, one over one minus t plus t square and, and one plus t, b, and we have a, a linear, the upper bound is linear for the uh, inference function. And so now we can estimate separately the positive and the negative parts of, uh, of the dot product that we are interested in. And doing so, it's possible in the vector case 
to obtain uh, estimators that will adapt. Uh, where, where is the result? Sorry. We, we, we adapt to, to the values of V. So now we don't need to know V and T to compute the estimators, so we can choose V and T to be ex exactly equal to these two quantities. But the price to pay is an uh, increase in the constants here. But other methods to be adaptive, like Lepsky's method, also lose a constant at least equal to two. Uh, you can do the same kind of thing for matrices. I will skip it. And we can, it's possible to do a special study for the gram matrix, because the gram matrix is a symmetric matrix. And it's de defined by the quadratic form. We can look only at theta, the dot product of theta and g theta, instead of having two parameters here. And doing so, we can have an, uh, we can have an adaptive estimator. I will give you the form we can have a, a confidence region for a gram matrix with diameter here given by this. So I still need to know a bound for the uh, fourth moment here. T is a bound for, for e to the, to the, the, for, for, for the norm of x to the power four. I don't know if I write, oh yeah, it's written here. So if we know this bound, but it's a bound bearing on the expectation of one-dimensional uh, random variable, so one-dimensional exhibit. Then we can adapt to uh, the di directional moments of order four here, and have a, 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 a confidence region whose uh, uh, in di the, 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 diam the diameter in, di in direction theta will depend on theta here, because it will be equal to the one over to uh, the product of this and this to the power one over four. And so it provides a better estimation of, the, of all, all the uh, eigenvalues of G. And you can, by picking up a matrix in the confidence region, you can have an estimator that is a, a, a matrix. And, and what you will control is the operator norm of the estimation error when doing this. So let me just do, tell you a, a word about the application to, uh, to least squares uh, rich regression. So I'm going to discuss the more generally rich regression where we allow a, p a penalty of the form lambda times the square of the norm of theta, but lambda can be equal to zero, so it will cover also the case, uh, the, the usual uh, case. So as I explained in the beginning, the idea is to uh, look at this uh, risk function here. The risk is defined as a function of uh, the gram matrix and a, and a random vector V. So now if you assume that you have estimators for the operator norm of G equal to G hat and for V hat. What I explained before will provide estimators of order uh, big O of the square root of log of delta one over delta over N under the assumption that uh, the norm of X to the power four is finite, the expectation of, and the expectation of the square root of Y times the square root of the norm of x is finite. So this means that if you have an independent noise, if you have a, a structure of the form y is equal to f of x plus uh, uh, centered noise, then the, the assumption of the noise is only that the noise has to be square integrable here. And under these assumptions, by considering the, amp the, the estimated risk here obtained by replacing g and v by g hat and v hat, you can derive bounds that will be valid for uh, in Hilbert spaces, not only in finite dimensional settings. So the, 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 the most obvious bound is a bound obtained by optimizing in theta in a, in, a, in a compact subset of RD. And then by, uh, you can simply prove that you have a, a slow rate of, of, of uh, order one over square root of N. Now, if you want to be a little more uh, 
clever, you can uh, look for a confidence region by looking at the, at the difference, at the risk differences. If you look at the risk differences, you can bound it by a convex function, gamma of feature and psi, that involves the, the differences of the, expect, of the estimated risks, plus uh, something that depends on, on the estimation error on the gram matrix here, epsilon, and on, on the vector v here. And of course, uh, the, sorry, there is a misprint here. Uh, it should be the, uh, very, very, the hat, should not be a hat here. Uh, what, what should be here is the minimizer of the, tr of the true risk, not of the empirical risk, or of the estimated risk. Of course, the, the, for the true risk, this quantity here is always positive, so the minimum of gamma has to be at psi equal to theta, and so zero has to be uh, within the subdifferential of gamma when psi equal to, to the, tr is the, 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 the optimal parameter that, the, that we need here. So doing the computations, we found this confidence region that is defined in terms of uh, uh, the, so uh, feeder hat is the minimizer of the estimated risk. And so the confidence region involves values of feeder that are at a distance from feeder hat that is measured like this. And when you, we see that, we can think of taking an, uh, defini defining an estimator theta tilde, that is uh, the minimizer of the norm within the confidence region. And if we take this, we will obtain a fast rate for uh, the estimation error. This is the true minimizing parameter here, but uh, measured by a a norm that is not uh, we, we don't have a, a, a fast rate for the for the uh, excess risk here but we the excess risk is, is the the distance between feeder tilde and, and, and the optimal parameter measured by the the metric de defined by the uh, gram matrix G so here we have the metric defined by the square. Sorry, there is a misprint here. It should be G plus lambda times the identity. I made a mistake. Uh, it, should be, it should be G times, uh, here it should be G times lambda, lambda I also. But um, we can't have a fast rate for, for the excess risk but we have a fast rate for a modified uh, measure of the distance between the, param the, the, the estimated parameter and the, and, and the optimal parameter that consists in taking the, the, the square of the matrix that is here, that it should be G plus lambda times I, the identity. And then, uh, so, and, and, so for, and for the excess risk itself, you, you deduce from this uh, a, a bound where you have to divide by the s lambda plus the, the smallest eigenvalue of the gram matrix. So this is depending on D. And now you can study uh, sparse, uh, sparse recovery using this kind of tools also, but I don't, I don't have time to, to give you more details. So I'm going to stop here for the first part. Thank you, Olivier. We have time for maybe one quick question before moving to the second part of this talk. Yeah. Could, could you say a bit more about the intuition behind designing this influence function that you use? How do you come up with that? Yeah. The, the, the intuition is to convert exponentials into polynomials by replacing the exponential by its Taylor expansions of order two, as it is as it can be seen on the on the uh, on the here. 
So what I want to do is to control uh, the exponential of f. But I would like to have, uh, to have uh, polynomial moments. So I would like to replace exponential f by, by its Taylor expansion of order 2. And to do this, I can do this by choosing for f a function of psi that satisfies this inequality because then exponential psi will be less than this is this is the idea the idea is to turn exponential into polynomials in one word The, the bound can be obtained for uh, any delta, but the estimator depends on delta. Because the optimal choice, uh, the optimal choice of the parameter lambda depends on, on the level delta here. Yeah. So if you don't optimize lambda, you can have results that will be, this, this, this one is valid for any values of delta, but uh, if you take lambda fixed, you will lose something. You, it's the same as in the one-dimensional uh, case that I published before. You can have results for different values of delta with the same estimator, but with a non-optimal value of lambda. Is it possible to have something weaker than that in the second moment? So, like I didn't, uh, I, I didn't write it down, but uh, it should be possible to, to, to work with uh, different uh, inference functions. If, you, if instead of putting uh, two t to the square here, you put t to the alpha with alpha, p to t to the power p with p superior to one, the constants will not be the same, but you should be able to obtain a result. I didn't try to write it down, but uh, it should be possible. Okay, so let's go on to Olivier's uh, talk. So I need uh, Just <laughs> some help. Continuation of this one. So specializing the previous result to the estimation of the mean or random vector. Okay, so thank you. So it's, it's, it's also a joint work with, uh, with Ilaria Giulini and the, the, the two preprints. One, so this is a paper that has been submitted and accepted by, by NIPS. And what I talked about in the first uh, talk uh, is in a preprint but is also available on, in, on, on my uh, personal page and uh, on archive. So I will come back to the question of estimating uh, the, uh, the, the mean of a random vector. And I will uh, try to find a compromise between the, sim the, the, the simplicity of the estimator and, and the bound I can, I can, I, we can prove. And so the idea is, here is to apply the influence function to the norm of, 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 uh, of, of psi of xi, of xi. So of course, if I apply the, the influence function to the norm, I have a much simpler estimator, because what I do is just uh, thresholding the norm of xi. So I'm projecting xi on a ball of radius uh, 1 over lambda. So here I can choose for the influence function psi the simple threshold function, that is the minimum of t and 1. It's uh, equal to this. And I consider why I replaced each sample, xi, by its projection of, on the ball of, of, of radius 1 over lambda. Here, this is what it means. And I define the, uh, the estimator of the mean as the empirical mean of the shrinked value, uh, sample. And so the idea to exploit this setting are that uh, so, if I compute the difference between one and 
Psi-T over T, because what, what I'm going to have to control here is something of a form Psi of T over T. Uh, so when Psi is the, the simple threshold function, and one minus this ratio is always positive or null and is uh, bounded by t to the power p times a constant depending on p, but this is valid for any value of p, be it uh, integer or, or non-integer. And we have projected on a ball of, of radius 1 over lambda, and this means that lambda times the norm of yi is always less than 1. So the assumptions here will be that uh, at least we have to have a, a, a bounded second moment. And we will assume that the directional variance is bounded by a known constant v. So it's the, yeah. Uh, yeah, so m is a notation. Uh, only v is known. Of course, uh, m is not known. <laughs> It's only a notation. M will be equal to the expectation of x. And I will, so we, we have to choose a scale parameter lambda. And we will choose for lambda uh, something depending, of course, on, on the di directional variance here, as before. So I state the result first. If we do that, we have a simple estimator of the mean. That satisfies, so we have a f uh, two terms here that are the same as before but with slightly increased constants. In the previous case, we have a confidence region that was not a ball, but here we had constant two, here we have 2.4, and here we have a factor four. And we have, so, we have the maximum of the expectation of the <laughs> Uh, the norm of x minus the, the centered uh, total variance of x and v. This is just if we are if we are if the if the estimation of v is, if the known bound for v is not is not too too bad v should be less than uh, than this quantity. But if it's not less, I take the maximum between the two. And the price I've got to pay for the fact that I have a simpler estimator are the, the, the remainder terms here. So the second one, C prime, is not a problem because it involves only the expectation of the, the norm of x to the power p. So I can take at least p equal 2, and I will have something in 1 over n that is of second order. So this, this one is all, always of second order. And this one is of second order also if I have a finite moment here for p a little larger than 1. And if I have only a, a, a second moment, then I have an additional term here that is going of, to be of a form uh, that is going to be a little, but it's not shameful. I mean, you, you can <laughs> it's just that you have the product of this with log. You, you have uh, the product of these two at the same time. but. So the, the, the idea is that if you have a little bit more than a second, the, uh, a second moment, if a moment of order a little bit higher than two is finite, then you get a bound whose uh, leading terms are the same as in, uh, as in for Gaussian concentration, although the data are not Gaussian, of course. So uh, how many? Um, if I have got five minutes. Okay. So let me tell you a, a word about the proof. So of course, the, 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 the main ideas are the same as in my previous talk. And uh, since I'm uh, computing the empirical mean of, 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 of a shrink sample yi, uh, I will have to compare the expectation of y with the expectation of x. And I can decompose the directional error between the error between the expectation of x and the expectation of y, and uh, the error between the empirical mean of y and, in, and its expectation. So for the first term, we can write explicitly what we, we, we have. Alpha is equal to uh, 
what uh, this, this this scalar, the shrink the shrinkage uh, parameter here, and so uh, we can decompose it like this, and then use the fact that one minus alpha is less than any power of t of a, of, of a lambda time the the the, the the norm of x to the power p. So we obtain this bound for the first term. And then the second term will be tackled using uh, a packed Bayesian inequality. And here, what we've done, it, the, the packed Bayesian inequality I, I explained in the first talk, it, it, it involves the expectation of the uh, perturbation of the parameter row filter outside of the log, but we can, we can put it inside because the log is being concave, it, it goes in the right side. So I, I, have, I, I have put the, using Jensen inequality, I've put the, the, the perturbations with, with respect to the parameter inside the log here. And then as the perturbation is Gaussian, we could use the explicit uh, formula for the Laplace transform of a Gaussian to obtain this thing. So now, uh, here, here the uh, filter prime is a Gaussian, so it, it's not bounded. But once I have integrated with respect to the, to the perturbation with respect to filter, I get filter that is going to be on the unit sphere, so it's bounded. I, I, have, I have to compute the expectation of the exponential of a bounded, of a bounded argument. And then, to do that, I can use the ideas in Bennett's bound. Uh, so the idea is to use the fact that uh, this function is increasing, and this one also, and that they are equal to 1 at 0. And uh, this allows to, to turn, all, uh, as in Bennett's and Bernstein's inequality, to turn the exponential into, into polynomials also. So now I've got something that is expressed as a function of the directional variance and of the total variance here. So for the total variance, it's quite simple because y is obtained by projecting x on a ball, so it's obtained by applying a contraction to, to x, and so a contraction will, will, will lower the variance. So, so, so the, the, variance, the total variance of y is less than the total variance of x. And for the directional variance, it's not the case, but you can explicitly introduce alpha, the shrinkage uh, ratio here, and use a convexity argument to, to relate the directional variance of y with the direction variance of x. And you will also have here the, what we have, our upper, upper bound for one minus alpha. And if you put all these things together, you get this inequality for, uh, per directional uh, estimation error. And then you optimize, the, 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 you optimize mu, lambda, and, and beta, and you, and you get uh, the proposition I, 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 I've shown before. You get this. This, uh, this inequality. So the, 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 the summary is that by using a shrinkage estimator, you, you, you can have an estimator of the expectation of a random vector that has uh, almost Gaussian concentration properties, and with uh, a complex and uh, so and in the bound you have no mention of the dimension d, so it's valid. Also, uh, although I didn't write the proof in a in a separable in a separable Hilbert space, it should be also valid in a separable Hilbert space, for instance, in a reproducing kernel Hilbert space. And uh, so that was, I think it's time to thank you. Again. Thank you very much, Olivier. Additional questions or comments? Uh, 
You have bound, for instance, we have a recent paper in Annals of Statistics by Lugosi and Mendelssohn, who used a, a median of means, a, a, a flavor of the median of means estimator. But the estimator is not easy to compute. And the constant you get here is equal to, uh, here you, you, outside of the, uh, I think that if I don't, I think that outside of the square root, you have a, a constant equal to 400. I don't think, I think that, I, I don't know of an equivalent, but maybe I'm wrong, but if, if Lugosi and Mendelssohn have published a bound recently with uh, millions of means and a factor 400, it should be that, I mean, I think it's the state of the art, but maybe it's not. But, Thank you very much for your attention and invitation. And so we now have uh, the second coffee break, um, and again, faster session uh, on the walls. And the next talk is at 3.30. pour la régression. Voilà, pour la régression. Oui, mais ça, de toute façon, c'est l'ordre 4 pour la régression, c'est le terme de variance qui est l'ordre 4, donc on ne peut pas... C'est assez les hypothèses qu'on a le goût aussi. Est-ce que du coup, tu faisais référence à quel papier euh, euh, le, le dernier, là, qui... Parce que, je ne sais pas si tu l'as vu, il y a un papier, en fait, de De toute façon, les constantes seront plus. Enfin, L'avantage du mode, c'est qu'il est, est, qu est adaptatif par rapport à la variance. Mais, par contre, mais c'est comme les méthodes adaptatives, que ce soit les psychies et tout, qu'on perd une constante. Ouais. Et puis surtout, c'est vachement compliqué. Ah, c'est plus calculé avant. Bah,